I'll just say my intention is to be of benefit generally. And I have a personal intention that my anger or resistance to Buddhism that I've had the last four years can be converted into something helpful. And that's what I'm working on personally. So let's see if I can get my screen share up. Yeah, where is it? Um, here it is. Um, so I'm imagining that most of you are familiar with the Four Noble Truths because it's the most primary teaching in Buddhism. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, I, what I'd like to emphasize is the cause and effect aspect of the Four Noble Truths. So I think a lot of people, um, maybe people have a misunderstanding of karma, which is cause and effect, and they think of liberation as getting off of karma, uh, of karma, of cause and effect, that you don't produce karma anymore. And um, uh, I hope that some of you are in that state. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> but um, what I would like to suggest is that there's always cause and effect happening if we're in a human body. And Buddha acknowledged this when he talked about the Four Noble Truths, that there is suffering in our life. And I'll just say Katagiri named this as holy suffering. Suffering is the actually the seed for our liberation. How do we learn to be able to handle our pain? How do we learn to get a really large perspective of life so that we can accept the holy suffering that is a part of human life? But he also said that there's a cause that increases our human suffering. And that cause is um, being attached to the things we like and being aversive to the things we don't like. And that point of view will increase our suffering. So there's a cause and effect here. This, the third and fourth noble truth, the third truth, uh, traditionally it's called there is cessation. Uh, I never, that never, that kind of languaging never got to me, but I like this. Our desires can be tempered and they can be changed and that will affect our sense of freedom. And that as Titnat Han would say, he said the third truth was well-being, that as a human being, we find well-being and integration and happiness. And I've been studying with Philip Moffat these days and he talks a lot about freedom of choice, that the more mindful we are, the more we know that our attachments create our suffering, the more we can have freedom of choice. Why is choice coming from our understanding? But all of that freedom is caused by following the Eightfold Path. So that's what I wanted to say about that. The, okay, so let me say what I'm interested in, in the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path is not an intellectual understanding. I've read a lot about this in my 50 years of studying Buddhism, but what I'm interested in is how do you practice with this really um, embodied practice in my everyday life in my moment to moment life. And the best instruction I've gotten for the second noble truth is from the Lojong slogans in Tibet, in the Tibetan tradition. And the, lo the slogan I'm going to hold up for us is the slogan, three objects, three poisons, 
and the three seeds of virtue. So the objects are like, dislike, and neutrality. So those, my understanding is that if you're in a manifest body, you will have those reactions. Like a cell in your body has the reaction when it looks at the blood. Oh, that will help me. That I definitely don't want. And if it's neutral, it just passes by. Or an amoeba would have this kind of neutral reaction to the external environment. So that we can't change. That's part of nature. Uh, this is good for me. This isn't good for me. Or I don't care. Or it doesn't matter. Or I'm neutral. Now, the point between the three objects and the three poisons is the important place for your mindfulness to notice. When does your like turn into attachment and greed? When does your dislike turn into aversion, anger, hatred? When does your neutrality turn into ignorance? So at that point of noticing when the objects are turning into the poisons, that's the place of practice and it happens all the time, all day long in the present moment. And what you do when you notice that the poisons have arisen is you plant a seed of virtue. And sometimes they say a mustard seed. It can be a tiny, tiny thing. It can be an intention. It could be a thought. It could be actually a body sensation or a feeling that you plant that is wholesome and positive in the same mode, in the same moment, really. And we have lots of virtues, values, paramitas, anything wholesome. You can plant a seed. You can look out the window and notice nature. You can take a big breath. You can practice generosity or patience or any number of things. So another way of working with the second noble truth is the eight worldly winds, which I know, I think that Vipassana people study this more than Zenis. I'm aware, I'll just say that I'm coming from Zen. I have studied Vipassana, but not a lot. And I'm just hoping that what I am knowing or experiencing will have some value for you, even though we come from slightly different traditions. So what I, I always have a dance movement when I talk about the worldly winds, which is Okay, so that you can't, that is uncontrollable. Sometimes it's pleasurable, sometimes it's painful, gain, loss. Now, when you look at this, can you decide, discern which side you'd like to attach to and which side you have aversion towards? <laughs> It's pretty obvious uh, that we attach to this side and we don't want this side. But the whole of our practice is to, and I guess this is kind of equanimity, is to be able to receive what's ever happening and to have an alignment with something that's larger than our likes and dislikes. So this is all around I think, the second noble truth. And this goes into us having uh, empowerment, self-empowerment, that we have a freedom of choice and we don't have to always live in the poisons. That we, through our understanding, we can know what is helpful and what isn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, uh, I love this part at the bottom, that protecting from our own reactive minds is our largest challenge. So really noticing my mind and working with my mind moment to moment. And also it just has to be a little seed. It doesn't have to be a huge thing. It's just a little pivot or a little shift that happens when I notice that I'm falling into the poisons. Okay, I'm changing a little bit now. I'm going into the Eightfold Path. 
Um, so I think I got turned on to the three bases or uh, the three bases from, oh, I thought I wrote it down. Let me see, Stephen Batchelor. I think that's who really emphasized the three bases. The three bases, the three bases are the base of the Eightfold Path. So Prajna or wisdom, Samadhi, which is unification of the mind. I was taught that to use the word concentration and sila with its with which is ethics and behavior. But what Stephen Batchelor taught me is that it's a three legged stool. It's a stool and it has three legs. Prajna, Samadhi and sila. And um, if one of those legs isn't cultivated, you fall off your stool. And that's the most integrating teaching I've ever gotten, really, is that the three bases have to be equally cultivated. And in Buddhism in the late 20th century and the early 21st century, a lot of people, a lot of teachers have fallen off their stools. And I um, have had a lot of consequences because of that. And that's when I really got terribly interested in and wanting to explore what it means to have an integrated practice. And I think the three-legged stool is one of the ways we learn how to integrate our practice. Now, um, I'm wondering, do you guys use what your word? Traditionally, we use right uh, uh, aspiration, right effort. Do you use that still, the word right? Or have you changed to wise? I've just said I can't use right anymore because it's too much like right and wrong. And I'm using wise. I'm trying to rework my tongue. After 50 year, years of using right, I'm trying to use um, wise. Okay, so this is the chart that I made when I was working at the prison. And it was partially because I couldn't remember the Eightfold Path, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, so I thought, well, under the three bases, so here are the three bases, wisdom, sila and samadhi and here's the stool the triangle in the middle is the stool that has three legs and um so i started to use this triangle with the three legs and then all of a sudden i could remember uh, because there was only two things or three things under each one so this has really helped me and when i taught at the prison every class we had this was up on the board and i would say okay we're talking about wise mindfulness today or we're talking about intention today or we're talking about wise speech so i could put the whole gamut of what i was teaching onto this chart and it was very clarifying for um, the practitioners at the prison and I'll just tell one little story about the main, one of the alpha, one of the alphas in my prison class um, used to say that the eightfold path was his tool belt. <laughs> and that when he needed his spirituality, he could look at which part of the path was what he needed at that moment. And he was a man who had enormous hands. In fact, I think that the prison registered his hands as a, a weapon. And um, he would ask his friends that when they noticed he was getting angry, that they would come up to him and say mindfulness. And then he would say, and I would look in my tool belt and I would try to find what is appropriate for this moment? That was so powerful for me. He was a wonderful practitioner. He was in for life. Um, 
and a beautiful, beautiful practitioner. He was a bodhisattva in the prison. So let's start to talk about this. I'm going to start at Samadhi because that's where I started. And I think that's where a lot of the 60s and 70s practitioners, which I am one of, started. We started with the idea that Buddhism was about meditation and concentrating the mind. And I think for some of us, uh, including myself, we were hippies and we were doing a lot of drugs and psychedelics and the concentration aspect of Buddhism matched what we were already doing. So that's kind of a karmic seed, I think, for convert Buddhism in America. And it's not such a great seed. I think we got a little bit off track because um, we didn't cultivate, mostly what we didn't cultivate was ethics. Um, I can remember in the 70s, Thich Nhat Hanh came to Minnesota Zen Meditation Center and Katagiri Roshi and he got along very well. And uh, someone asked him what he thought of American Buddhism and he rolled his eyes and said, uh, you, got, you people should study ethics for 10 or 20 years. That was his comment. And I think it's because we were all stuck over here and not developing all three legs of what Buddha said was our practice. So that being said, I'm going to talk about uh, this a little bit. Um, just wise concentration, being able to unify your mind, being able to place your mind is a kind of power. And in Japanese, they call it jiriki. And it's the power to actually place your mind. And if we want to change our behavior, which is what I'm interested in, which is down here, wise behavior, you need to have that type of power so that you can see when you're acting from a habitual pattern that is harmful and you have enough energy to plant that seed of virtue right there. And that requires a lot of concentration or attention. And wise mindfulness is that attention. So they work very closely together. And one thing I've been wanting to do is to include, you know, Shin. I'm not sure if this is in your tradition or not, but in Zen, Shin means mind heart. And in the beginning of the translations, it always got translation, translated as mind, mindfulness. But you could also say heartfulness. And when I say heartfulness, I have a change in my vibration. So I've been experimenting with saying heartfulness as much as or more than saying mindfulness, partially because I have been over-concentrated on mindfulness. And this is getting into something that I want to speak about, which is the feminine in Buddhism. Uh, and I sigh. <laughs> Um, I spent 50 years in, in Zen, which is mm, a fairly masculine form, I would say. And I was a Zen teacher. I taught that form, even though I was a woman. And I think it emphasized transcendence and the mind. And it de-emphasized uh, emotions, heartfulness children, family life. And I'm trying to reorganize myself now. This is partly what the four years away was to reorganize my Buddhist path to soften, to have more love in it, to not think of it just as transcendence. Um, I'm wondering if that makes any sense to you guys. Is that just a Zen thing? I, I don't think so. I think it's all through Buddhism that there is a tendency 
to emphasize the transcendent and not emphasize the ordinary, even though it's there, uh, especially in Zen. I mean, we talk about cooking and uh, weeding the garden, and we have a lot of grounded practices, a lot of practices that get you in your body. But I still feel like, for example, mindfulness of the emotions. Well, when I was first in Zen, wasn't even taught. Uh, now it is because all the, you know, we're picking up a lot of Vipassana things and Vipassana is picking up Bodhisattva things. So we're all kind of merging a little bit. But I'm thinking that um, using heartfulness for a while might help me and maybe the community to, to move out of its only transcendence. Um, let's talk a little bit about wise effort, because this also has to do with balancing the doing part of, of Buddhism and the receiving part of Buddhism, the discipline part of Buddhism and the softening of Buddhism. So um, not too tight and not too loose is from Pema Chodron. And actually, wise effort traditionally goes under samadhi, but I'm putting it in the middle of the stool because I think it, it, it's ever, it goes to everything. It's how, how you're working your practice. What kind of effort and are you doing or being all this balancing act to get to the right tone of our attention is a balancing act and it has a lot to do with embodiment i know a lot of people are talking about that these days but i think people are talking about it because we have to counter what we learned originally which is kind of getting out of the body and going into mental states that um somehow didn't descend. So I've also been trying to balance what I'm calling ascending spirituality and descending spirituality. So of course we need to ascend. We need to connect with our higher consciousnesses. We need to see um, uh, things that are larger than our egos. Uh, we need to feel unconditional love that does not come from Judith Regeer. She is not unconditional. Uh, but if I'm in touch with my higher self, I can learn how to be unconditional. So there's a lot of transcendence that needs to happen. But what I'm thinking in terms of the feminization of Buddhism is there's also a lot of descending that needs to happen. So I'm quite with Titat Han when he says, we should spend a lot of time with sila and ethics, with what wise speech, wise behavior. And that's what I'm calling embodiment, that our understanding leaks down and actually changes our behavior. Uh, I, when I used to teach at Cloud, I would always say, what good is wisdom if it isn't changing our behavior. And the last joke, this is kind of a joke. I have to tell people it's a joke so they won't think I'm totally arrogant. I would like to add a ninefold path. <laughs> this is Judith Regeer's edition, which is wise amount. And that has to do, I think, with wise effort and also with wise behavior. But this has been very helpful for me. What is the wise amount? What is the wise amount of money? What is the wise amount of food? What is the wise amount of relaxation? What is the wise amount of television? What is the wise amount of reading the newspaper? That has really helped me modulate come into balance with what is helpful 
and what isn't. And what is helpful and what isn't goes into wisdom. Oh, I'm skipping all of these uh, cards, but that's okay. Here we do. Wise view. Wise with, uh, this is the first um, of the Eightfold Path under wisdom. And this is where I also am thinking about ascending and descending. So classically and traditionally, what I was taught about a uh, wise view was that I understood the three seals and that those permeated my understanding and everything I did. So of course, there's the one impermanence that everything changes. There's no centralized self. And the third one has been very interesting because for decades, I learned it as dukkha, that there's suffering in the world. And then maybe 15 years ago, the Dalai Lama and Thich Han changed it to nirvana. It was like, what? They changed dukkha into nirvana as the third seal. And I've been contemplating that a lot. Like, what does that mean that the leading Buddhist teachers in the 20th and 21st century changed that? And how I began to think about it is that the third seal for me is that there is transformation, that I can change my view. I can stop my second noble truth, my attachment and aversion. I can really cultivate equanimity and I can take the suffering and transform it like alchemy into freedom or liberation. So that's how I'm thinking of the third seal. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. And those are all what I'm calling the transcendent or the ascending understanding. Now, I haven't heard the divine abodes. I think you call them the Brahma Viharas. I haven't heard them put that much into wise view. And I'm saying that this is very, very important that the descending qualities, which is all about loving the conditions, having compassion for our human lives, uh, learning equanimity so we can balance our uh, attachment and aversion. And that both of these ascending and descending, the heart qualities of wisdom uh, have to be viewed together. And the second, uh, you, I'll just, you can see here, we did wise view. Now we're doing wise intention. Um, so I'm very involved in practice with wise intention. Uh, I have intentions, I do usually do year, well, I have life intentions, you know, I, I made vows when I was, became a Buddhist, I made vows when I became a priest, I made vows when I became a Zen teacher. So those are long standing vows. Um, but I also make yearly intentions. I make monthly intentions. I follow the moon cycle and make intentions for my moon cycle. Um, I have weekly intentions and I have daily intentions. So I practice very, very much with intention because it focuses my mindfulness and it, may, it brings up my alignment with my values in my behavior in daily life. So I wrote down some intentions that uh, Buddhists sometimes have. Um, I think I did that one. Okay, so now we're moving down to sila ethics, which I'm very involved in at the moment because I think this is the most 
this is the base that most has to do with uh, how you are behaving in the world. And to me, that's the most important thing. I often fail. I often do harmful things. I often do uh, hurtful speech, but that's where I'm focusing. So for example, the last four years I've been studying nonviolent communication, which has really changed the paradigm of my life so much and really is helping me bring all this stuff into my daily life. And wise behavior is pretty much the precepts, which I have a slide about that. But I want to get to the, this is another Judith Regeer change uh, that I think is kind of humorous. But this has always been done wise livelihood. And I, I never really, I thought, well, I'm not a butcher, so I'm doing okay. Or, you know, I'm not working in a gun factory, so I'm doing okay. So I never really tasted this Eightfold Path. And about a month ago, while I was getting ready, I've been doing this uh, talk to other places. A month ago, I said, oh, that's actually wise finances. Like, how are you with your money? And where are you getting your money? And how do you spend your money? And how much money do you need? So um, I'm investigating or trying out, ca calling that wise finances rather than livelihood. And I remember long ago, this was in the 70s, um, Trimpa Rinpoche used to emphasize uh, that if your finances aren't stable, he doesn't mean you have to be rich or a poor or anything. <clears throat> he talked about stability. If, you're if you are living out of survival, then you don't have that much time to work on spirituality because you're always working on your survival needs. So this wise finances is to lift us out of survival, stabilize our finances so that we can really practice uh, spirit and spirituality. It's very, very grounding to uh, be stable financially. Now, uh, this is from Zen. We have 10 precepts. I know that you have some. I'm not sure what they are. But um, I don't think we really work with these enough in our actual habitual patterns in our life, our life with our family, our life at work, our life in the Sangha. And um, I, I think, you know, you could just take even one of these and study it for a year and it would be so fruitful and it would get you. I think it would increase your mindfulness concentration. I think your understanding of non-self would grow. So I really want to elevate our working with our behavior. Hmm. So um, all of this I wrote in the introduction to this book. So if you want to find it, you can find it in this book. Uh, although what I gave today to you today is my upgraded uh, version of what I wrote. The other thing I'd like to just say is that I have a new book that's coming out July 5th, and it really works on how am I exercising my hatred in my life, and how am I working on changing my behavior? And it deals a lot with trauma, about how much that, there's so much consequences from uh, different types of trauma, a personal, systemic, and intergenerational. 
So um, that's coming out July 5th. And I, I'm going to have a talk on this at, Co at Common Grounds. So let me just put up, maybe I'll take, uh, should we keep that up? Like we could go into question and answer or comments. Um, maybe I'll just stop the share. So uh, my book is quite a, uh, so let me just say, I, I've had a lot of trauma in my life, sexual trauma. I'm a Jew, so I have inherited trauma. Um, and the system in America has a lot of built-in trauma, racial trauma. So that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. And it has a little bit of all of those. But one of the main messages that I have um, is if you have a very disturbed emotional body because of trauma, you need more than Buddhism. Uh, and what I did, uh, and unknowingly, because I was just, just trying to survive in a way when I was younger, I met Katagiri Roshi when I was very young, like 19. And I, I did 12-step recovery. I got in about 25. And I still do 12-step recovery uh, because of the support. And because the actual, the 12 steps is a very clarifying frame for how you work through past um, troubles, uh, steps four through nine, which I couldn't find. I looked a lot in Buddhism and I couldn't find too much about how you untangled your karma except for transcendence, which, uh, which is very important. So you need Buddhism. And then I've done a lot of therapy and trauma-related therapy. So I did a three-pronged approach uh, entwined. And I don't think either one would take you all the way. I think the combination is what allows freedom to start to happen in a very disturbed emotional body. So, and I, I have to say, I wrote this book, it's very personal and I went through all my horrible stories, but I have found a release. Uh, the last year has been, I've been in a different place, but I couldn't do it without Buddhism because Buddhism is the most profound, the deepest level of release. But I also couldn't do it without uh, therapy, which goes into the stories. And I could not do it without group emotional support, which you can sometimes get in Buddhist sanghas and sometimes not. That's my experience. I've been 50 years in Buddhist sanghas and I don't always feel enough emotional support. Is it okay to say that? <laughs> totally agree with you. I started out, well, I started out in everything kind of rigid and self-righteous. Uh, I was an oriental medical doctor, so I came from an alternative approach so I, in the beginning, I was kind of down on um, mental health medicine, brain chemistry medicine. But I have also had one-on-one -on -one talks with hundreds of students. And in doing that, I realized it's, a, it's another tool. It's another way and if it suits you, and if there really is a chemical imbalance in the brain, why not? And it's just part of learning what helps and what doesn't help in your particular condition. Thank you. Uh, I'm just scanning to see if there's another hand. I see that someone wants to see the precepts. 
you know, I'm going to try in the next week or two to get um, my PowerPoint up on my website because a lot of people have asked for that, but it's not there yet. So let me see if I can share the precept page again. I have to figure out, oh, here it is. There, there's the precept page. Uh, this is um, the 10 grave precepts in the Zen tradition, and you could Google it and get it. Uh, there are a lot of different um, translations and ways. So what to say? If by any chance you read my book, you'll know that it is true that I'm pretty courageous. Um, you know, life and death is a great matter is a Zen, a Zen thing. And it's very courageous. The whole of Buddhist practice is very courageous in that you're facing what it means that life and death is a great matter. You're facing what it means that everything changes. So that means there's a tremendous amount of loss every time you turn around. Things have changed. Um, to face my shadow, uh, which is a lot of the book is about holding hands with my shadow, to face the things that are, I'm going to say it very crassly, <laughs> Does that face the things that are wrong with me? You know, uh, my patterns that hurt people and hurt myself, um, my lack of listening, all the things that go, would go on the default side. But in order to change them, to be liberated from them, to find the freedom that Buddhism says we can find, I really do have to face them. I really do have to face systemic racism, for example. And it's very painful and demands a lot of courage. I really have to face what happened to me. And, but, and, that courage, that holy suffering, as Katagiri used to say, that is actually what's the inspiration for the alchemical transformation that Buddhism offers. So uh, courage has a lot of consequences, positive consequences. <laughs> Maybe I could say it like that. Is there anything else you would like to ask? There was a question going to the Jungian idea of shadow. I think I am, but I haven't studied Jungian. Um, what I mean is, um, and actually this goes in the uh, category of ignorance or denial the parts of myself that I deny or the parts of myself I would rather not see, the parts of the system I live in that I would rather not see. Um, all of those live in the shadow of my psyche. And in order for me to have freedom, those have to be released as well as the things that are visible to me. Is that the same thing as the Jungian shadow? I think this will automatically happen when you're meditating. Have you noticed that? When you go on a retreat and then all this junk starts to surface and you think you're doing everything wrong. But actually that's good. That's the stuff that needs to be cleared out and Sometimes just meditation will clear it out. You know, if you sit with the pain of that long enough, it will clear out. But I've also found that studying my 
stories. See, that's the other thing I think classically or traditionally Buddhism has dismissed our stories. As there's no centralized self, so these stories are a delusion and you just drop them. I have not found that to be helpful or bring me liberation. In fact, the whole book is about really exploring my stories. And through that exploration, coupled with meditation, I can actually, I, I don't know what happened. The Dharma did it to me that they got cooled out. I'm just not as attached to them as I was. Of course, I wrote a book that took five years and I'm publishing it and now people are gonna read it. So, holy, wow, what have I done, you know? But what the consequence for me was that I don't have to go there anymore. Well, I'm going to try to answer as authentically as I can. And it's very much about me. I don't think it's really, uh, maybe not general. But prior to this four years, I spent a great deal of time in silence. As a Zen teacher, I spent 40 years going to retreats all the time, being silent, letting the Dharma work on my energy body. I did a lot of work in that arena. And the last four years has mostly been about integrating that work or even countering that work with living at home, facing the issues I have with my sons because of being in silence all the time when they were little, um, all the parts of my psyche that I pushed aside so that I could assume the role of a Zen teacher. It's a very big role and it's protective in a lot of ways. The, um, and I had to take that protective mantle off for me to really learn how to be a human being. So I did not go on retreats the last four years. I did meditate every day, but not like I used to. I meditate in a big comfy chair. I have a pot of tea and a piece of paper. So, and a fire, usually in the winter I have a fire and in the summer I sit outdoors. And I am quiet and I am silent, but it's much, much looser than it used to be when I was doing Zen practice. And I just needed that as a balance. And I'm not sure I'll go back to being tight, but I'm not sure what's gonna happen to me, to tell you the truth. I don't know what, where this book will land me. And I don't know if I'll teach again. I don't know where I'm going. So did that answer your question? Silence wasn't my problem. <laughs> Actually, talking to people is more my problem. Non-harmful speech. Judith, we're, we're out of time and I, I just wanna thank you so much. Uh, I feel privileged to get this little wise preview to your upcoming book. And I, I think we'll all look forward to coming to your program uh, about um, your book as, as that comes up, I think later in the summer. Um, yeah, so Bows, thank you so much. Um, could I sing my um, offering prayer as a close? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. I made this uh, when I was also a different time when I was a reclusive and I meditated on the dock and I made this little song. May the merit of this penetrate into each and everything and all places so that we and the world together may realize the Buddha way. Thank you so much. <laughs>